for joining us. This is going to be a lot of fun today. I'm I'm so glad you took uh, the time out of your day to hang out with us and talk about Wardley Maps. You're the best. All right. So to kind of get things off to uh, started today, we have a poll for you. And um, what we're going to do is ask you to go to slido.com. And this is poll 1678797. And I'll also post a link to that in the chat. If is you'd it like just to join. slido.com? That's right, slido.com. That feels very web 2.0 for some reason. <laughs> yeah, probably Slido. is. Slido.com. Hey, Rod, welcome. Hey, Rod. Good to and see you. For those of you that are just joining us, there's a Slido poll open. And we're what we'd like to ask you is like, where are you at in your Wardley mapping journey? Where do you fit into this spectrum from never heard of it, this is my first time, to being Simon Wardley, you're so familiar with it, that uh, Wardley Maps is old news to you. Ben, is this meeting recorded? I can remember if you said it already. Yes, it is uh, yeah. being live streamed to YouTube at the moment. So we'll make sure that uh, you all have a link to Perfect. that things like that. If you need to watch it later, we can send a follow-up. So yeah, um, for those of you that are just joining us, we've got a poll going. We're just checking in to see where everyone's at. And I think there's a trend emerging. Uh, if I if I am bold enough to say that, looking at the results, looks to me like there are a lot of folks here who have seen it before but haven't tried it. Would anyone here who fits that description be willing to share a little about, a bit about your experiences? Like, so like, what have you seen? Like, what does it seem like it's all about? Anyone want to share a little bit about that? Would love to hear from one person. Anyone feeling bold? <laughs> I can do that. Hey, thank you. Hi, Thomas. Uh, so I've, uh, I've had a session with Simon Wortley uh, some time ago. Uh, one and a half hours, two hours, uh, and I've been researching it a bit, reading about it, uh, working a bit on a my robot, uh, but haven't tried it yet. Haven't had the opportunity to try it out with the with the with the customer yet. So that's basically awesome. it. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a great great point. Like, has anyone out here uh, started reading the book at all? There's a free book. Yeah, Rod's like thumbs up. I've got this. <laughs> <laughs> Leandro's like I've. Me too. Yeah, Leandro, do you, do you want to say a few words? Uh, <laughs> sorry, guys. English is not my English is not my first language, so sorry if I say something You're great. wrong. Today I am at Try It, and I want to be at Use It regularly. So I'm here okay. to to change my stops. Awesome, <laughs> awesome. Well, you're in the right place for that. Thank you for joining. Okay, so we've got a good sense of the balance here. It looks like a lot of folks have seen Wardley Maps before, but haven't tried it. A lot um, have, this is their first time hearing it. And plenty of people have tried it. And a couple of you use it regularly. I see you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, David, do you want to say a few words about who we are real quick before we dive in? Yeah, um, I'm Ben and that's David. And also the other way around. I'm just seeing <laughs> if you're listening. Um, we do a lot of work together. Um, we're both independent consultants, but we collaborate on pretty much everything for the past four years, three years. Yeah. It's we a wrote great journey. a pip deck. If you've seen it, you might be tired of seeing it um, by this point. If you haven't seen it, um, get excited. Um, we wrote a thing <laughs> called strategy tactics. It helps pretty much anybody use the tools of strategy in the work you're doing day to day. You don't have to be a CEO. You don't have to be a strategist at a fortune 500 company. 
Um, you can use almost all of the things in this deck, save a card or two, uh, regardless of where you are in your own career journey. And a lot of the work that we've done on the deck comes from wardly mapping, from Simon's thinking, work, uh, writing uh, work, also including a lot of work from a friend of ours, Jay Bloom, who is getting his PhD still and currently and forever in the field of transition design. PhDs take a really long time. And yeah, so this is, I think actually some of his ideas have been published for the very first time in our deck. Well, our flavor of his ideas, I'll say. Um, so if you want to know more about this, you can ask us during the Q&A. Absolutely. I don't want to spend too much time on this. We're here to learn about Wordly Maps. But if you have this or you're thinking about getting this, there's Wordly Maps stuff in there. Um, yes. So this will overlap a bit with that. Yeah, and we'll, we'll share a few of the Wardley Maps specific cards um, during the process here. Uh, and what I'll just say too is is the same link that we used to do the poll at the beginning is also where we can do our Q&A for today. So if you'll notice when you visit that Slido link that's in the chat, there's going to be a tab on towards the top for Q&A. And... Um, so the poll that we just did, we've got our results and things are all done there. So I'm going to end that. But we'll have an audience Q&A that we can um, gather questions as we as we go along. And we'll have plenty of time for those today. Our plan today actually is to start with a little bit of information, like maybe 20% information, and then an 80% balance of just hearing what questions people have, what they've experienced, what they've seen. But we figured that there are a lot of questions that Maybe we could answer up front just by sharing a little bit about what we think Worthy Maps is about and how it can help you. So in the meantime, if you uh, would like to record your questions as we go along, at any point, just pop open that Slido tab, hit the type your question and just type it in there. Include your name if you'd like to talk with us and, and explore your question a little bit deeper. And then just hit send to send that question to us. All right. With that, um, this is Simon Wardley, or, or at least this is this is how I know him. And um, Simon Wardley is a is a lovely gentleman, lives in the United Kingdom. Um, our our friend Kat Swatel would would say that Simon lives in a swamp, which I think is technically correct, uh, marshland or something like that. He gives great hugs. I'm just getting the most important information out of the way up front. And he loves helping people do strategy. He loves sharing how he thinks about doing strategy. And this is him and his element. This was at Map Camp Atlanta, which we helped organize. Um, it was at the Georgia Aquarium. So it was a really great venue. And this is Simon in the middle of three tables that everyone just smashed together uh, with him in the middle of it. And he's the happiest I've ever seen him because he's pass out little mapping templates and he's teaching everyone how to map. So this is this is how we th know Simon. Simon, of course, invented this thing called worthy mapping, and we'll talk a little bit more about the history there. First of all, he sees himself as um, the history, I guess, here was he originally um, started getting interested in the question of what strategy is all about when he was a CEO. And he felt uh, like many folks in leadership for the first time, feel a bit of imposter syndrome and where where are the hidden secrets that everyone is supposed to be using to do this well surely there's something surely there's um some some hidden secret about how to do strategy that no one else is telling me um and i'm sure people are going to figure out that i'm an imposter at any day and so he kept digging into that question, like, wh where are the secrets? Where are the secrets? Where are the secrets? And was not, like, thrilled with the answers that he found. SWOT diagrams, big lists of fancy words, executives performing self-soothing rituals around, yes, we will be digital and we'll put the users first. And all the good buzzwords from this last year and everything that I read in the HBR and whatever 
one of the big five consulting firms is whispering in my ear. Uh, quantum hacking. <laughs> That's going to be the next thing next year, right? Whatever that is, like we're going to be quantum first, right? Just insert your buzzwords here. I'm sure Gen AI and LLMs are just starting to become the the slightly less interesting thing. And I wonder what, what's going to be next. It's probably going to be something ridiculous. And he was just looking at us going, well, is, is this all there is a strategy? It, that, that can't be true. There's got to be something more. And let's just uh, shorten the journey for a bit. He did a lot of searching, found his way wandering um, into a bookstore where the, the shopkeep recommended picking up a copy of The Art of War. And in fact, picking up multiple translations of The Art of War, because truly, um, in the words of Derek M.C. Yuan, uh, a Hong Kong-based scholar uh, who works to make The Art of War and generally Eastern modes of strategy more accessible to a Western audience, the West is still today stuck in the translation phase of understanding these works and uh we have we have rod leverton on the call today and uh, he knows a thing or two about that i'm sure he could say some words but what will what what simon realized is um there's something here and as he was analyzing the art of war he discovered um something he called Sunsa's five factors um we're gonna do our own little riff on those but essentially it broke it down into these five things First, you have to have a purpose. You have to have a reason for doing things. You have to have principles of operating. You have to have patterns that you can recognize in the world. And you have to be able to have plays, options for movement, um, stratagems, if you will, just like little tricks for how you might manipulate or move things in the market. And that's that's like Sun Tzu's version of this, but it all depended on this one thing, which was an understanding of the landscape and so um, I called this the five P's. So purpose, principles, patterns, plays, and maps or something. <laughs> Almost got five P's there, pictures. <laughs> so there's you have to have something to point at. And so he's like, okay, to understand the landscape, it seems like we need this thing called maps. There's There's something missing from the world of strategy, maps for business. We have maps in the military. We have maps to understand strategic situations for, you know, war and things like that. But where is the equivalent of this kind of way of orienting to the situation in business? And he's, he did a whole bunch of study into like what a map is and like what kind of qualities it should have. But long story short, he came up with this thing called Worthy Maps, and we'll, we'll show you a couple. And I wanted to share sort of an incomplete list of applications of Wardley Maps. There's a, a huge variety of things you can do with this. Um, hu many different kinds of pictures you can draw, let's say. And I think it's helpful to orient to them from different scales. Wardley Maps is about modeling. It's about making sense of the world that you're in. And as a result, every time you sit down to make a map, you kind of take another like slice of a small portion of a very big world. And you're only going to be able to look at a couple key components of that world. You're going to choose what to include. You're, and by default, you're going to exclude the rest. That's what makes these maps useful, right? Is they don't include everything. So you can actually make sense of them. But there are three basic scales to this, right? You can you could use maps at a market level scale, thinking about all the different players, what they're all doing, um, in, in the words of Roger Martin, like where to play, how to win, competitive intelligence, things like that. What partnerships should we build? What alliances should we build out there in the market? Should we acquire this organization? Should we create a standard so that a bunch of different ecosystem players align around some things that are that are more common? And generally, like this question of industry shaping. So that's like market scale. I, I see Wardley Maps more commonly used at organization scale, where you have to look in, in inwards to start, because that's just where you're looking anyway, right? A lot of organizations are, are focused internally rather than understanding how they fit into a market. And so for better or worse, um, that's where they start. And so at an organization scale, there are basic questions like, what, what should our portfolio be of our different products and services, right? 
um, most fundamentally, where should we invest our limited resources in maintaining what we have and growing where we need to grow? And generally speaking, you know, you can use it for other things like modernization or build or buy or dealing with toxicity, divesting um, parts of the business that are toxic, killing work that needs to have been killed a long time ago, that kind of thing. And then at the person scale, worldly maps can be used just as, as an individual. You're in a messy world. How do you make sense of it? This is a, a useful way to take a first step towards making sense of a confusing situation. Um, I've also used it for like just basic project management. Like what are all the moving parts that I need to make sure that I'm aware of so that I can set an intent for those moving parts and also monitor how the interventions that we're putting forward for each of those parts, how they're working or not working. And uh, those of like Kelsey Hightower have used maps for uh, monitor, to, to make career changes, to decide what kind of companies they want to work for. Uh, I've used maps as well to sort of model my own like internal ways of thinking to make sense of my own like lived experiences. So this is an incomplete list, but generally I think it's useful to think of it at, in terms of scale. Different people are going to use maps in different ways. I believe all these are valid. I think David and I both do. So it's just a good way to get a sense for it. Um, as far as how to make one, how to make a map in, in Wardley world, uh, first you make this thing called a value chain and a value chain for those of you in software land is, is basically a dependency tree. But for those of you who aren't, it's made of these basic components, who's, what's, and how's, and then the relationships between them. The who's are who's getting value from a situation. So you can look at the market and say, the customer is supposed to get value here, but also so are the shareholders. Also, so are the regulators in terms of their expectations of what the organization is supposed to give. If you're looking just internally, you might be like, ah, the PMs need this and the board needs that and the executive needs this and you can, but yes, also the customers need that as well. You can look at it in that scale. And then the what's are like, what do they get? What's the nature of the value? What benefit are they receiving? And it's just surprising how many organizations don't have that locked down. They don't know who they serve. They don't know what needs they're meeting. It's like, how can you meet? How can you follow through on your promises if you don't know the answers to those questions? So at the very basics, Worthy Maps starts there. And then how do they get it? What's your working theory of how the system that we're a part of produces those needs? And so we like to say who's what's and how's because it's a it's a nice quick way of understanding users' needs and your capabilities that are being arranged in, in some arrangement. This depends on that in order to produce those needs for those users, for those people. So that's a rough like idea of what a value chain is. But to turn a value chain into a Wardley map, you add one thing, and it's evolution. And you take all those same components top to bottom, right? They were like users depends on needs, depends on capabilities, depends on other capabilities. Now we take those, all those different moving parts and we position them from left to right based on this thing called evolution. And the short version of evolution is just, if it's towards the left, it's probably rare, risky, and you're lucky if it even works once, but it might be valuable in the future versus the far right, which is more standard, boring volume operations. It's surprising if it ever fails. We just have expectations about it. And there are some stages in between. And if you want to learn more about that, you can dig in uh, with the resources we'll share today. And just to give you like a sense of like, what's a map look like? Here's some examples, Uber for pets. And I'm just going to go through these real quick just to kind of give you a sense of what the different kinds of applications can look like. Not so you can sit here and study these deeply or whatever. This was a joke map, if I'm being honest. Um, here's one for whether to hire a pro or do it yourself for repairing your walls when you put holes in them, if you're a renter. Here's one for uh, how math metal works, uh, if you're into music. Uh, here's, here's one about what Descript is doing, because it's really interesting how it came about, how efficiency 
in one area, AI transcription, produced innovation, transcript-based video editing. Here's a basic one for how to build an online course. Uh, you don't have to just draw on paper. You can use online tools like Miro. There's a Wardley Maps canvas in Miro in the default template library. You can use sticky notes and things like that. You can sketch it in your favorite digital tool as well. So here's one for uh, misinformation, disinformation in media. And here's one for COVID-19 pandemic response. So just giving you a sense of the, the wide variety of these kinds of maps. Um, here's one that I did in an enterprise modernization context. So if you're into the tech scene and you, you do kind of modernization things, there's applications for that as well. In this case, get out of the data center was one of our points here. And these things can get really complicated, but you don't have to start with complicated. You can, you can start small. And generally speaking, the point of the map is not just to make a picture, it's to help have a conversation either with yourself or with others around you. Are we using the same words? Are, do, they, do those words mean the same thing? Are we building that common language so we can even talk to each other about what we're proposing? Do we agree about who we think we're serving here? Do we agree about what we think they need? Usually the answer is no. And you have to have those conflicts because that's how you pay down the years and years of basically knowledge debt, alignment debt that you have. And do we agree that this is how things get done, that this is how we actually meet these needs? Chances are there are multiple working theories about how user needs get met in the organization. And generally speaking, like what's happening and what are we going to do about it? What are our options? And what if we did this versus what if we did that? The map gives you places to point at and say, we want to talk about what we can do here, not over here. And most importantly, uh, Wardley mapping is free. Simon Wardley gifted it to the world and he licensed it Creative Commons attribution chair like which means anyone can learn it. There is a free book. And before we jump into the Q&A section of today, what we want to just offer is um, we put together a learning plan with a bunch of different resources that might be a great follow-up for our session today. And if you want to grab a copy of that, it is at lwm.events slash learning plan. And of course, if you want to read the free book, you can just pop open Google and go Wardley Maps book, and there'll be a page that pops up and it'll give you a bunch of options. Um, it's it's also on, on Medium. That's where Simon has released it primarily. Uh, and I'll just put a link to the learning plan in our chat here, lwm.events slash learning plan. All right. So I've done the I've done the info dump section, and now we're gonna switch to conversation. And we're going to start looking at questions we have. So if you if you haven't already, uh, when it comes to Wardley Maps, what questions do you have? There's a, a link to a Slido in the chat where you can submit your questions and we can go through them together. And we'll go one by one. So, so Rod, I see you have a question up. Uh, I'd love if you could share a little bit about your question and, and let us know what you think, and then we can talk about it a bit. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> well, and I know on, on your site, you have like a list of all the various tools and, and uh, it can be overwhelming because that's, it, as you start getting into worldly map, you're like, well, should I just do it in PowerPoint? Should I just do it by sketching? Should I do it in Miro? You know, and if you take Ben's courses, you know, Ben has a really um, unique way where he uses Miro and uses sticky notes within Miro and basically draws all the connectors and everything. And it's a really kind of great collaborative way. It doesn't create the type of maps that he just showed you, but it's a really great way to interact. And then there's folks that are, you know, that make these really polished looking maps, um, you know, yeah. like Joaquin. And I know they're using like maybe draw IO and things like that. So there's just so many different tools. And sometimes some of the tools are better for collaborating when you're working with other people. Sometimes they're better for when you're trying to build a really polished map that you want to communicate with something. So maybe you could talk a little bit about you know, the choice, and there's a lot of also ones, some of the ones that Simon uses too, 
um, you know, that are um, more uh, command line based, <laughs> if you yeah. will. So if you could talk a little bit about that, I think that would be helpful because I myself, I get tripped up on that. I'm guessing other folks do too. That's awesome. Yeah. Does anyone else like face that struggle too? It's like, what tools should I be using? Like, where do I even start? Um, would love to hear some more thoughts from folks. And in the meantime, I'll just pull up and kind of there's there's a library of tools on the Learn Worthy Mapping site. Everything from architectural tools to you know templates in Figma and, and all sorts of different sorts of things. I'm partial to uh, to these little paper templates and things like that because I think pencil and paper is probably one of the best ways to get started without getting tripped up by all the technology and doing it right and making it look pretty and things like that. There's all sorts of things here. And of course, I'll put a link to that in the chat and zoom. It's learnworthymapping.com slash tools. I like using tools that let me make mistakes easily. Yeah. And then fix them. So sometimes paper doesn't work for me. Um, well, I usually use a pen, which is not forgiving yeah. for mistakes. But pencils so like have made a comeback like, in my world because yeah, of that. Miro yeah. is great for me because <laughs> I can scribble on a post-it note and delete it or move it around um, and not feel like it's cemented on paper. Um, but yeah, I think paper and pencil is a great choice or like a writing, yeah, handwriting kind of a thing. And there was something in that question too, which... It, I think Chris Matz um, said this about just generally speaking, when when you you're working with artifacts, which maps are artifacts, they're they're pictures, they're they're snapshots of moments in time, and if you make them really pretty, and you use tools that produce like professional looking output, then one of the things that Chris Matz would say, I think, is that it actually can make it harder for other people to participate, mm -hmm. uh, to contribute to the artifact, because it looks finished. It's done, right? And if you look at something that's a little bit sketchier, and sometimes I, I do this by picking weird fonts, um, Comic Sans, anyone, um, just to be a little silly, at, but for the point of saying, hey, this isn't done, this isn't supposed to look professional, it's supposed to get the job done. It's supposed to help us talk about the situation that we're in. Yeah. For any any designers that might be with us today, knowing that, you know, when you when you produce like a really polished deliverable and you try to explain, no, 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 this this thing is supposed to change over time. How often does it really change? <laughs> I just had flashbacks to pages and confluence just living forever. Somebody wrote it in 2016 and it never got touched again. So Rod, just checking, does um, does that help kind of get started in, in, on that question a little bit? Any reactions to that? Yeah, I, and um, uh, I haven't really spent any time with the ones that, that I know, because Simon does, uh, you know, he, what's the tool he uses? Is it the online worldly mapping.com? Is that the one that Simon uses? Yeah, it's online worldly maps. Um, and it, it's basically, it's got a, something called a DSL, a domain specific language. It's just code, right? You write code and out comes a pretty picture that's a map. And uh which is great, but it's not for everyone. But it's it's a not me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you use it at all, Ben? Or do you shy away from it? There's a plugin that so Damon Skelhorn made online boardly maps and it's it's such a good tool um, for for the folks who like working in code, like they like to write code. Mm -hmm. There's a plugin mm -hmm. for Visual Studio that he made as well that uses online worthy maps, and I'm a big fan of that. But if I'm being honest, the vast majority of my work either happens on paper, or it happens in something like Miro. Right. Fair enough. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah, I use the Visual Studio extension. But then when I start to share it with people in my uh, organization, not everybody wants to use it. And it's, it's hard to collaborate, basically. So we moved to, uh, I think Atlassian has a, a new feature. Uh, Confluence has a new feature similar to Miro. That's great. Yeah, that makes sense. 
Yeah, there. And Justin, I see your I see your hand. I'll, I'll uh, come around to you just real quick. But one thing I wanted to mention is that um, if you're familiar with the idea of pair programming or mob programming, it's this idea that you leverage multiple brains, but only one person is driving, only one person is typing, but you're you're discussing together and making the decisions line by line together. Um, those modes, even if you don't do code, if you just look up mob programming, it's basically you get a bunch of people in a room, you have discussions, and one person turns those discussions into the thing that goes on the page. And you could do that with sticky notes. You don't need to do it with code. I think that's a really um, useful way to go about it. So yeah, Justin, I, when I get to you, what what's on your mind? Yeah, thanks, Ben. I, I, I'll, I'll go a little meta for you. I, I like actually using evolution to help you with my tool selection. So if I, if my idea that I'm trying to map out or, or the, the situation I'm in is, is, you know, new, foreign, I'm still new to it, just started processing it, I'm in Genesis, I'll, I'll use something like this. This is my virtual, this is just a, um, a personal size whiteboard. So it's, nice. it's a whiteboard, but it's like a palette. And it's kind of like, I've got an agile background. So it's the idea of like writing on something small and physical, kind of like your physical paper cards. Yeah, it helps you kind of constrain the idea so that you're not getting too wild too fast and you got to make it fit on the board. And if it starts, you know, if you start blowing out the boundaries, then it helps to kind of control your focus or know kind of maybe where your next steps need to be. And then as I, as the ideas progress from, you know, Genesis, you know, custom maybe is when I'm ready to show it to somebody and to start collaborating. So maybe we need a bigger whiteboard or some sort of digital medium to, to collaborate virtually. If I'm presenting it to someone, then I'm probably graduating from custom to product and I've got to have something that's a little more polished. So I may go to a, a tool like Miro or Envision or, or a virtual whiteboarding. And then, um, yeah, I don't know how, I don't know if that eventually ever even gets to, uh, gets to commodity, but um, if it does need to be artifacted as some sort of architectural diagram or some sort of codified yeah. decision, right, c consumed by a wider audience. Then that's the next kind of the next stage. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that's that would I found that's that so helpful. helpful. Yeah, I love that. I like I like I like small before big, um, yeah. because you you spend more time thinking about what to put in the limited space that you have, which can be really helpful. Um, yeah, and as far as like tool choice too, the other thing I think that Rod was pointing out, and I just want to share this before we move on, is a. Uh, there's like map there's there's the image or the tool for work like doing the thinking together or even on your own right and then there's communication there's like using it to distribute the information that you found and oftentimes i just wanted to share that i i find that the map is not what travels the report that i write as a result of the map where i list my arguments and i expose all the logic behind it is what actually ends up traveling and it ends up being more of the communication mechanism. So the tool changes again. It's like, oh, it's a Word document now or a Google Doc or something like that. So awesome, great. So we got some more questions and I'm just gonna pop open the screen share again. So thank you, Rod. That was an awesome uh, topic for us. So um, some anonymous here writes that they're in the same position Simon the Wardley was in looking for tools that allow them to work out what their tasks are, what they should be, and then how to get them done. David, this this just makes my brain light up because that hmm. reminds me of like our name your game stuff. And um, maybe it looks like Alex Frost. Uh, yeah. yeah, that was me. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Brilliant. Hiya. Hiya. Um, basically, the position I'm in is that I uh, I ran my own business for seven years. It was really small and I did everything. I didn't have terms or names or descriptions for anything I did. I just sort of got it done. And now um, within the last week, I've been made creative director of a company. Oh, wow, yeah. And I um, have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> I need to work it out. And I also need to work out things in a way that I can explain to my boss so that he can then explain to the owner. An added problem is that I only speak English 
my boss speaks good English, but his first language is it Italian, then he yeah. has to translate it into German for the owner. Wow. So wow. Every, everything needs to be super clear, um, which is why I'm looking for tools to make clear what I want to do uh, over the next sort of, well, short term, medium term, long term. Yeah. Um, it, it, that's where the, the scales come in a little bit, right? Because what would you probably ideally want to be working at is either market level scale or organization level scale at the very least. But when you get started, you can't, there's just too much happening and you, you really have to start at the personal scale. What do, right. what do I see in front of me? Um, okay. Who seems to be in the picture that is benefiting from the situation? Okay. And sometimes um, like David and I wrote a card called name your game uh, for the strategy tactics deck. And it was just, it was just about figuring out what your small scale purpose is. Mm -hmm. And, and at, at first, right, when you start a job, it's like, well, I'm just trying to figure out what's going on. And it's like your window that you're looking forward in is like really short. It's like, I'm just living week to week. I'm living in the moment. <laughs> <laughs> and I... you can't do that forever. And so it's, no. it's a, about the process of gradually stretching your perspective and say, okay, my, my game this week is to figure out what the heck's going on. Mm -hmm. My game next week needs to be a little bit bigger than that. It needs to be more about meeting as many people as I can or whatever it ends up being. Sure. The map gives you a place to start with, with who's in the picture. And so I, I would, okay. I would just keep a list of your stakeholders. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, David, did you have something? Yeah, I was just thinking. I mean, also along with that, some of the, there's some other things in in the card deck that we kind of get out with that that go back to Wardley mapping is like, can you make sense of your environment slowly as you're getting up to speed? So like, okay, look at what another team is working on. Like, I don't know how big the company you're in is. Um, it's it's not huge. Uh, I can explain a bit about what it is and what we do, and it might help. Um, so it's a hotel uh, with, um, no, I'll start with my, I was a, um, I'm a DJ, I uh, ran an entertainment business. Um, now the company I work for, I already DJed for them for the last five years or so. Uh, it's a hotel with four bars, two clubs, a couple of restaurants. So a uh, whole operation. The, yeah, yeah, it's not huge. It's the hotel's only got about 30, 35 rooms in it, but it's um it's in a like a high level resort in Switzerland. So um I my task really is to uh, raise the game of the clubs and the bars in there um and sort of give it some creative direction as it were so i already know most of the people involved um excuse me but it's just uh like i said i need to find a way of getting the owner like my, my boss is already completely on board with everything i've gone over it's getting the owner to understand mm. what he needs to do now um yeah and a few of the so a lot of the moving parts, a lot of the different people involved um, are kind of on board, but aren't as passionate about it as um, the three pe three main people involved are me as the di a creative director and DJ, um, the club manager, who's actually also my wife, uh, and then the owner, um, not sorry, my boss, who's the general manager, then the owners above him. And it's kind of getting things through him so that he can release the money for us to do these things. Yeah, that makes mm -hmm. sense. So, yeah. One of the yeah, things I think... I... Sorry, David, go ahead. <laughs> Being able to create a shared picture of what's going on, especially if there's a language barrier, can mm. be great. Yeah. Um, because images can transcend language sometimes. Yes. Um, yeah. So I think like you know, as you're getting yourself set up, like Ben said, figuring out like what's just the immediate circle around you that you need to get going. And then what's yeah. just beyond that? Like who's doing things? And so like if you're if you're working with like clubs and you have it sounds like you've run your own entertainment business for long, long enough to know the ins and outs, yeah. right? So yeah, yeah. Like if you're thinking about logistics of like what needs to go what needs to go in and out as far as like equipment 
staff mm-hmm. um is there like what goes into like getting the club like up and running every night mm-hmm. you know there's it's more than just like playing music and turning lights <laughs> on right like yeah. you there's staffing there's <laughs> so many things that go into getting all of that like mm-hmm. going um even just like logistics right so what does that picture of logistics look like for you like what are all the moving parts and pieces can you yeah draw that yeah right. Com- coming back and, to this it's like the who's what's yeah. and how's of of the small scale local situation starting with what you have starting with what you can see yeah and and then like once you have that locked down and you understand it it can be as simple as like make start with a list instead of worrying about fancy diagrams right like okay yeah. who who do we see we see some customers we see some folks who are on the staff we see some folks who are in the kitchen we see some folks who are you you go down the list like that yeah and then like what do we have well we got lighting we've got you know the dance floor or whatever like build out the language okay. and have conversations about like when i say this i mean these things what do you think of when you hear those words mm. and like getting getting the words to sort of flag the meaning basically like point to the meaning yeah so that everyone understands what each word means in each term it's yeah. agreeing on terms it, it doesn't yeah. have to be like perfect agreement but yeah it's yeah, it's yeah. like okay getting practice I, I think that would be an amazing place to start okay, yeah cool. and i think the next the next thing i would look at once you kind of like have the stuff like drawn down is when you're thinking about what you want to do that's where evolution could come in handy where you might be saying look this process that you guys are doing it's like everybody else in the world just like flips a switch and this happens but like you've got somebody doing this by hand every day like you have someone like loading in and out equipment like every night but like everywhere else they've just got like house gear set up and it's like ready to go that's like probably not the most efficient example i could give you but like you know just one one thing where you could say like yeah i understand like this isn't the picture of how i see this club working at its best and like if it was more efficient if it was like what other people are doing at least we'd be in a much better place. We'd save time, we'd save money, and we could put that over here into this new thing that I think would be a killer aspect for the club that nobody else is doing. And we can do it because now we have more time and money. And then you can kind of like go out, like you could eventually look at how how the whole company is running and find really interesting ways to like... um, Yes. That's get exactly. everything kind of integrated and working together beyond beyond even what you're responsible for and point out like opportunities wow look at this over here now that we have it drawn down um it's kind of clear that we could put these two things together and and like do something great I, yeah that sounds great to be honest that sounds exactly like what i want to do um she's it's basically designed in a way to um to work out where the spaces are in what we're not doing and where we can expand into it if that makes sense Mm -hmm. so yeah writing down what we're doing first seems like a an obvious and great place to start and then um sort of going around that yeah we we call that eating the elephant start starting small and kind of like working out in concentric circles a little bit Um, starting with what you can see with your eyes yeah, just yeah. a lot less certain, a lot less uncertainty with that. Okay, uh, cool. Thanks, Alex. That was great. Uh, thank, thank you. Thanks a lot. So we got another anonymous question here about how can we flexibly apply worldly maps for dynamic teams, fostering collaboration and strategic adaptability. So a couple words jump out to me there. Um, there's dynamic teams. So to me, that sounds like the teams change, right? There's collaboration, like making sure people can work together. And then adaptability, which means not getting locked into one thing forever when the information pops up that says you should be doing something else. And I don't know if the person who shared that is on the call, but one thing I thought I might do. That would be me. Excellent. Hey, Andre, how are you? <laughs> hey, not too bad. Uh, thanks. Um, 
Ben and David, of course, for hosting this awesome session. Um, I Thanks might be coming. camping on um, Rod and Alex's question, it, maybe just repeating it in, in so many ways. But uh, I think the big part for me as a product design lead um, is the flexibility aspect and dealing with the uh, the constant shifting of organization. So for mm -hmm. me, the, the top three things would be like facilitating collaboration adapt to changing priorities and supporting strategic decision-making. And I think as a, as a simpleton, you know, my brain, you know, maybe just giving a, you know, some examples of, of just how to do this. <laughs> yeah, no, that I, I, I love that question. It makes me want to just um, switch gears for just a hot second to do, do a little bit of drawing and Here's here. Okay. Repeat what you just said, right? You said, you said changing, you got dynamic teams. You said changing priorities. Yeah. Is that changing right? priorities and uh, supporting strategic uh, decision-making. Okay. And, so, and decision-making. So and of what, course, what, facilitating collaboration, which is the big part, I think starting out where I can collaborate with as many stakeholders and maybe my team as well um is the big part um because i know as designers we tend to make very complicated things at first which seem very sacrosanct but i'm more of the type that likes to create something that i can have folks collaborate with so we can yeah constantly work on it till you know and iterate it so we can get to something that really works for um our customers etc yeah so for everyone here, one thing you might notice is that I really locked into the words Andre is using. And I think when you make your first maps, it's really important to pay attention to that language. And when you when you think about what goes in a map, part of what goes in the map is the work you're doing, the things you want, the technology that's involved, the people, their needs. And so I'm hearing I'm hearing these specific words, right? There's decision making that needs to happen. There's priorities and, and they're changing all the time and there's collaboration that needs to happen dynamic teams i'm i'm going to operate on the assumption that these belong on the map somewhere i don't know where yet but i'm just going to throw them on here and i'm i'm going to switch gears to ask andre who is is in the picture and like in the broadest sense of the world like decision making facilitating decision making with whom for whom with whom is it executives? Is it leadership teams? Is it team members? Where does that fit in? Hmm. Did you need to answer that? Yeah. Like who, who, oh. <laughs> who, who's going to be doing the decision making? Uh, executives, of course. It's going to be executives. Okay. Yeah. So, so executives need decision making. And just for fun, like, do they, do they see decision making as like something that's sort of like a gamble? Like they're just kind of like winging it all the time more of like making decent bets um do they do they just expect it kind of to be like business as usual like more of a, a thing that they just hey we need to do this let's do this or is it more of like baked into the cost of doing business like where, where what's their expectation of that kind of decision making along that spectrum I, I would assume it well i wouldn't really assume i would say that it's probably between user demand and cost of doing business okay Great. So, and here's what I'm doing. Like, I'm just, I'm building out the map in a, in a really small way, bit by bit, because that's all you really can do is bit by bit. And already we can start having conversations about, okay, the executives need decision-making. Every time you see a line in a worldly map, you can just imagine there's like a, a needs relationship. Executives need decision-making. And now I'm going to ask this, Andre, like, what does decision-making depend on? In order for decision making to work, what does it need? There might be things in the picture already that it depends on, like maybe facilitating collaboration, but there might be other things too. So I'm curious what comes to mind for you. Well, let's let's give an example. Let's say we're looking to raise the stock price of the business and mm -hmm. we need more customers to either be subscribing to the product. So the executive team would look to design and research and say, hey, we need to um, up the design. We need to make this design work. Whereas us as design and research, what we would do is say, all right, what are customers looking for? Mm -hmm. um, how can we provide value for customers and then bring that to the business and say, hey, here's a decision that 
we feel we should be making based on what customers are looking for. Yeah. And of course, what what's happening in the marketplace. Yeah. And it's interesting already you're pointing out the contrast in the way that you're making decisions, right? So the customers need some kind of value. The executives need a decision making and, and the decision making actually depends on that kind of value. That's what you're trying to, to say. Is that right? Correct. And they're quick to jump to like design or something like that. And, but like, where is design in this picture? Like, we don't know. We, ha we have to do the work to collaborate to find out. And Whereas so exec, exec would usually say design is um, just changing the curtains or the look and the feel of the brand or the look the aesthetic and the feel. Um, so, whereas we in the product design aspect would say, all right, it's not just the aesthetics of it, but making sure that it's functioning and solving the problems and reducing friction for yeah. our users. Ooh, okay. So this is really interesting. And um, this is probably where we'll, we'll have to leave it just because of time. But what what you notice whenever you make maps is like these, these sort of interesting comparisons jump out at you. And mm -hmm. what the executives are saying are, hey, design is just changing the look and feel. If we change the look and feel, that'll provide the value. And you're saying, wait a minute, no. <laughs> Solving one of their problems is what's going to provide the value. And boom, like the conflict becomes really like in your face. It's like, oh, uh, no wonder we're talking past each other. Like you're talking about aesthetics. I'm talking about people's lives and changing the problems and the, the way that they solve them. Um, that's... And so... If I was on if I was on your team, Andre, as a designer in the room, I might even look at this and say, whoa, whoa, actually, you know, we have all of these meetings with executives and they want to make these decisions. And, you know, as designers, we tend to say, well, what's the user value? What's the user need that we're solving? What what really matters? Where you're the voice of the user. Now, I mean, more than more than us as designers should be the voice of the user. But, you know, at least that's a place where we kind of sit more often than not. But I might say, I think, Andre, when I'm looking at this, I'm not convinced that the executives believe that the decision making is tied to some kind of user value. I think the executives might think that the decision making depends on uh, shareholder value. Like, what does the business want? Like, I'm not convinced they care about the user needs. So then you get into like some other questions like, okay, what do we need? Like, what kind of discussions or work do we need to do with executives around that? How, how do we mitigate that? And like, I don't have an answer. That's a huge question I think designers in general have is like, how do we convince executives that design matters and what does it really do? And that users have needs and it's not just business needs, um, which are equally important because um, you know you need business needs to make money and pay paychecks and do stuff like that. Yeah. But, yes, definitely. Yeah. And it's suddenly when you when you do these little this little exploration, you start to realize, oh, the game is different than I was. I thought this was about, you know, just trying to get them to listen to me. Like, <laughs> I have to convince them that providing value to the customers is going to give them the benefits that they want. Mm -hmm. That's that's a different challenge. And but those are the moments we look for. I would just quickly touch on Alex's question is like, where are you today in this week? Which conversation do you need to be having today for the for what you personally care about, right? Like there are a lot of layoffs going on right now. Is the appropriate conversation the shareholder versus user value and fighting that fight? Or do you need to somehow mitigate the kind of like a little bit less look and feel a little bit more problem solving is the thing that I want to achieve with this conversation. Like what makes more sense to focus on right now? And then what's the bigger battle over a longer period of time that we maybe want to make small steps towards? And then Rod's question uh, earlier, as far as tools, like 
in order to do something like this in a conversation, what's the most comfortable thing to for you to do this quickly without having to think about doing the activity? That's kind of what I look at. And what's what's easy and quick enough that like if we don't ever look at this again or we throw it out or change it, it doesn't matter. Like we don't feel like, oh my God, I spent so much time doing that. Like, I can't do it again, you know, so. Something I'll just share with this is that um, one of the pieces of advice that David and I give to people, regardless of what position they are in the organization, is have your own intent separate from your bosses. Like, decide for yourself what you want for the organization and what you want for the work. Mm -hmm. Because the minute you start doing that, you start having to make your own decisions. You start getting the practice in strategy. And when you start making those decisions, you start figuring out real quick what matters. And so when some nonsense comes down the pike and you have to deal with it, you you have it in perspective. Um, you're able to sort of hold it up against everything else. And when you make a map, you can say, I'm trying to intervene here. I'm not trying to intervene here. You get to point at it in your head and then later you can pick this map back up and go, oh, right. What was I doing? I was trying to do this, not that. That's right. Oh, but I could do these other things too, I remember. So it's about placeholding your thinking just as much as it is about deciding what your intention is and so on. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I would just add briefly, there's a strategist that Ben and I really like, uh, Richard Rumelt, who wrote Good Strategy, Bad Strategy. It, it tends to be a like if people read strategy stuff, people have heard of that. Um, I just started reading his latest book and something that he said in there that I thought was really interesting was the first step of strategy isn't defining your purpose or like uh, like a value statement of like, here we are here because, you know, mission kind of vision stuff. It's diagnosis. What is the challenge and what are the opportunities? And if that's true, this is a great way to do that. Yeah. How do you diagnose what's happening if you can't see it or sense it or have yep. some kind of understanding of all the pieces and parts that are going on? And what you probably will find, the more you do this, the more you'll realize you don't know a lot of things and you need to talk to other people to find out all the stuff that's missing. And you get a little piece of that picture that's in everybody else's head in order to understand the whole. And that's what really helps diagnose things and find the opportunities. And honestly, a lot of what I find useful about this is like doing what we just did here. I just found a bunch of opportunities and I didn't have to come up with some genius idea. It was like, oh, it's yeah. right there in front of yeah. me. They're obvious, they're right there. You just have to look. Hey David, I'm gonna I'm gonna put I, I apologize for the bit of small promotion, but I'm gonna put a link into an article yeah. that I wrote on that very subject where it takes yes. Sun Tzu's five Sun Tzu's five factors, and then it takes Richard Romelt's thing and says, Oh, well, how do these you know basically good strategic thinking has been around forever? It's not unique to any one culture or any one, you know, uh any one any one time period. But what it is is it takes Sun Tzu's uh, five factors and talks about what they are take talks about it kind of in the context of how simon warnley discovered them and then i take richard romelt and i overlay that so you can see how that's basically the same thing and, and richard's approaches you know is, is really quite simple and um i find it very helpful it basically says what's the problem how are we going to solve it mm. and what, are the, what are those actions look like but i'll post it in here i love it yes, okay with please you guys. do that's, that's please, amazing please. wonderful rod we, we rod, love you and rod's awesome we recommend reading all of the stuff that Rod writes and checking out all the stuff Rod does. Yeah. F few scholars like Rod. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't laugh. Okay. Uh, and, and a few music musicians like Rod too. Like you, you play a mean guitar. Um, so just um, realizing or recognizing that it's the top of the hour, what I'm just going to do real quick is uh, one more time plug the, the learning plan that we have here. It's at lwm.events uh, slash learning plan. And um, David, I, I was thinking we could stick around for a couple more minutes, answer a few more yeah. questions. Yeah, I've got a little time. We we didn't get to all the questions, so maybe we can do a couple more before we yeah. go. I'll put a link to to the learning plan in the chat. If you sign up, you'll, you'll hear about the events that we're doing. Um, you'll hear 
you'll be the first to hear new articles about worthy maps and things like that. Um, and, and also you'll get that learning plan in your inbox. It's a whole big list of resources that you'll be able to uh, use to kind of pick, honestly, like pick and choose which direction you want to take as you get started with worthy mapping, because there, mm -hmm. there is no one way to learn that is right. You have to find the way that works for you. And the status quo is spending seven years thinking about it before you ever even try. So you can overcome that status quo just by finding something that um, you find find interesting and, and helpful. So that's why we give you all those options. Um, if you got to go, thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for spending time with us. You are you're welcome to run away if you have to. David and I are going to just spend a couple more minutes sort of after our style going over some of these other questions. Um, I yeah. think there are just a couple. Let's, uh, you want to say goodbye to the live streamers? I guess um, as well. Well, okay, maybe maybe we'll like hold off on after hours after hours we'll just do like a couple more questions just to okay. provide value for the All live right. stream and All then, right. Sounds then good. we'll stop the live stream and then the real conversation happens which by the way <laughs> when you join these events there's almost always an after hours and it's not recorded <laughs> so you if you want to be part of it you'll have to join these so awesome so the the next question i saw was from leandro um, next question here about software development, Kanban, Agile. How can I use worthy mapping in my day-to-day? -day? And I have some thoughts on this. David, do you have some thoughts? <laughs> I'll let you get, I'll let you geek out on that That's one good, a little yeah. bit. Yeah. So in, in software development, oftentimes you're having conversations where you're trying to, to agree about what the situation is and what to do. And so if you want to make a, or do some of the map things, right? Without necessarily like forcing a bunch of people to learn worthy maps. One of the easiest things you can do is just come back to that, um, going back to the uh, the who's, what's, and how's. Like, so in the next meeting that you attend, bring like a little notepad with you or maybe a sticky note. And your your only job in that next meeting is to write down who are all the people getting that value, getting some kind of benefit or pain relief in this situation. And just listen in the conversation and hear how often those people come up or if they come up at all. And if they don't come up, I think you should ask the question, who's going to benefit from this? Doesn't matter what the topic is. If you are proposing any kind of change or doing any kind of planning, it's because you think something's wrong with the way things are and that you want to bring about something different. I hope you're doing that because you're going to meet someone's needs, um, even if those needs are self-serving. Like, oh, the, the PMO just wants this or that or the other thing. Uh, So-and-so is looking for a promotion. Like, note those for yourself. It's like, okay, the PMO is in this situation. The executive is in this situation. Yes, we're talking about customers too, but nobody said that word yet. So maybe I should ask, how is this going to impact them? And that's just your your task for the meeting. Pay attention to the who's. And if you can do that, like it's levels, right? If you can do that next time round, add in what they get. Pay attention to who's getting value and what they get. That's your next homework assignment for the next meeting. And then if you get good at that, then you know build the next level. It's like, okay, who's how's, sorry, who's what's in house? So I know who is in the picture. I know what they get. And like you start to notice that like you start writing down the same thing every meeting. It's like interesting. Okay. I, I'm starting to get a sense for who needs what. I can just kind of hold that in my head as background knowledge now. How is it going to happen? How is it going to be created? Oh, it's feature development, right? Or it's um, conflict resolution or whatever it ends up being. Figure out what the hows are. And if you can do that, expend your next meeting, do who's, what's, and how's, then you can start modeling. Start the value chain. Start sketching during the meeting just to yourself, the who's, what's, and how's, and what depends on what, so that you personally can pay attention to what is being discussed, just so you can ask good questions. You don't even have to show anybody anything that you write. Just say, hey, it seems like we're talking about X and Y. It seems like they both depend on Z, but nobody's talked about Z yet. 
So what's our plan for Z? You just have a good question to ask at the right moment. And that's the game. Like as you build up your progression in learning how to make worthy maps, if you get more familiar with evolution, you start to add that into the picture, the principles, the patterns, the plays, all that stuff you can add in bit by bit. So that's how I would think about that. I, I hope that helps Leandro if you're still here on the call. I yeah, think thank you. Yes. Did I miss anything? No. Uh, I, I get it. I will start from this path. All right. And there, there's always more to be said about that. Um, there's a lot in the day-to-day -day that you can do. And just looking down here, how another question from someone. How would you adopt the perception in industry part of the evolution axis to account for improving customer service? And um, I hope this is legible, but this is just a table of, of Wordly's evolutionary characteristics. And just to help kind of read it, you've got your stages of evolution along the top, one, two, three, and four. Wordly says everything evolves from left to right. And you can look down the left-hand side. You've got these different characteristics, like certainty. Is something poorly understood? Is it rapidly increasing in learning? Is it rapidly increasing in use? Or is it commonly understood? And that's just kind of how you use this table as you sort of check yourself. Like, where do I think something is in this journey? And so the, the question here about was about perception. How would you adopt the perception in industry to account for improving customer service? And I think that's that's like, how do you connect the dots from all this worldly mapping stuff to like a real world proposal? Like we got to improve customer service. And I think the way to think about that is when you look at perception in the industry, I, I would actually look at probably um, the user perception so if you if you kind of like pop up here to um, market ecosystem perspective, if you read this, it says in Genesis, things are chaotic. There are no expectations. Weird. All this stuff is strange. In the custom build, it's sort of the domain of experts or it's seen as a competitive advantage. In the product stage, it's, you know, we got increasing expectations of use. And there's advantage through implementing this or that or having these features or those features. And then in stage four in commodity, it's just, you know, it's trivial. It's just, we have these expectations, they should be met, end of story. It's just the cost of doing business. And so to answer that question, how do we, how do we know when we need to improve customer support? Well, probably when there's a mismatch in expectations. David, do you have any any thoughts on like mismatched expectations or anything like that? Well, I was just thinking I had a customer uh, customer experience experience recently, and like looking at these just to kind of point out how where something fits in a category, even if you're looking at the market, is still debatable. So, like I would say, in my my own belief is like customer service should be. A commodity like it should just exist it should be good it should be there it should work for everything um but in that case it's just efficiency right like you improve it through being more efficient however even though most most companies have customer service um let's just say the a benchmark maybe is like Amazon. I mean, boo Amazon sometimes, right? Like buy local, whatever. That's my opinion. But um, I buy a lot of things through Amazon because it's convenient and useful and affordable. But whenever I get something from Amazon that I either don't want or it's broken or I get it and go, eh, nah, I, I didn't. Why did I buy this? Yeah. I just have to like press three buttons and it goes back and they give me my money back. Easy. Great. So compare that um, to like, sometimes you get stuff on reverb, right? Which is like this custom. Yeah. Kind of... But 
I had music. I had an experience a couple days ago where I bought an online course. It was 50 bucks, no big deal. I watched a few minutes of it and realized this is not for me. And I looked at, it was like, they didn't really outline what you got inside. I just kind of took a gamble and bought it. And I started watching. I was like, oh, the whole thing is like for if you've never, ever done this kind of thing before, ever. And there was like no contact information, whatever. I had to kind of hunt down the customer service email. I sent an email. I said, you guys are great. I like your YouTube stuff. I bought this thing. It's not for me. Like, can I get my money back? The customer service agent replied to me, like, I don't know, maybe a half an hour later, like pretty quick, and said, no, no, it's actually for you. Keep watching. I said, well, at this point, I'm 50 minutes into the hour, and it's not for me. <laughs> and they said, no, no keep watching it's for you and at that point like i haven't gone back to the email and i was like wow it's been a while since i've asked someone like hey i know what i'm doing can i have my money back it's not a whole lot you know i wasn't saying like i bought a thousand dollar thing or i bought a car can i just bring it back i don't want it and it kind of sucked and i was just like wow i was really not expecting that and you know, 50 bucks isn't the worst thing in the world. And like, I'll probably finish watching it at some point and just chalk it up as a business expense. But that was kind of a bummer. I yeah. was like, that's really weird, especially because it was like a live person and not yeah. like a robo denial. I think like some for some things, I would expect the customer service to be terrible. Mm hmm. Like if, if uh, nobody's ever done something before and it's, you know, I don't know, like imagine, imagine the customer service of the Wright brothers the first time they're <laughs> launching a plane, right? It's like, you're lucky you're here at all. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we bought this plane and uh, he died. Can we get some money back? <laughs> <laughs> no, that was what? like, you jumped from the Eiffel Tower. Like that's you, you yeah. like you were committed to that. So I think there's something there about the gap between expectation expectation and reality. If people expect something to just work, which tends to be on the right side of evolution again like in product and commodity, well then it better friggin' work. And if it doesn't work, you better fix it with good customer support. Mm -hmm. But if people are along with you for a gamble and they know that it might fail, that's actually where I would where I would look, maybe, is like the expectations around failure. Mm -hmm. in genesis yeah. we expect it to fail so it's fine like whatever customer support doesn't need to fix everything which like funny enough paul paul uh gave us a link to a kickstarter in relation to i think a different question and kickstarters are probably a good example of you're you're putting money down but you might yeah. never get this thing and like if you're mad about that it's on you as much it's as kind it of on, on you yes yeah. <laughs> i mean yeah and like people can be upset and it's like okay yes d d differing levels of upset let's say mm -hmm. but it, but it's about that gap in expectation i think that that's how i would think about that question all right and just coming back to uh there we go How can I promote deeper thinking over time in an environment where superficial quick wins dominate? Woo! That's fun. Andrew, do you want to say a few words about that? Because uh, I can certainly riff on that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the obsession with quick wins is kind of a scourge. Because um, it's basically like saying... I just want things that are easy. And I, I would even go as far as to say that's probably like a self-soothing thing where it's like, I, my life feels so out of control that I just need something to feel like a win or I need something to feel like we did a good job. Yikes. 
Yeah. And I'm sorry about the trouble unmuting, Andrew. Um, in the bottom left-hand corner of the Zoom window, there's hopefully a, a mute button or a, a little microphone icon. And uh, you might have to help it select the right microphone or something like that. Uh, with a, there's a little up arrow next to yeah. it. I I can I can add a little color around this where I yeah. use mapping uh, for that very scenario. And please, and, Rod. Um. And I, so I, I I worked at at Dell Technologies and and uh, for about twelve years and I I resigned last year took took some time off, but I was in the process. I worked with a with a pre sales engineering group. So. All together, we're talking about six to seven thousand people of pre-sales engineers. You know, really smart people that basically their 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 process, their role in the sales cycle is to make sure that the the right technology is sold to the customer, that the right technical win is sold. So, you know, mm. just to make it really simple, and one of the things we were looking at was uh, was this kind of this notion of vertical practices. Like, well, how do we how do we develop knowledge excellence? We have all these SEs, you know, and and we have you know thousands of them across the globe, and how do we we how do we take them and make them aware or situationally aware and and maybe build up their knowledge excellence around a particular vertical whether it's manufacturing or health or whatever whatever it be you know and it got to the point of of quick wins it kind of got to the point of like well we're going to create these verticals and we just want to make sure that people are signing up to them i said really that's that's the outcome we want. We just want people that people are signing up to these verticals, you know. And I and I and I won't show the show the where the map. I don't have it actually anymore. But uh, you know, basically what I did, I said, all right, what's what's the customer looking for? And I started. I, this is completely out of just being guided by Ben. You know, just how Ben would think about this. I said, all right, well, what's the customer want? Well, the customer wants expertise. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Well, what is what is expertise? Well, that you know, we're thinking that comes out of this notion of a vertical practice, which is a very. I mean, Microsoft is their entire sales team is shaped that way. It's all by it's all by vertical. So obviously, this is a very common approach. Um, and then you know, you have all right. Well, what are the kind of component parts of that vertical expertise? Well, there's the product that we sell that goes into that. There's the partners that we work with, and then there's the SEs. And we were you know had, kind of having this conversation where people just wanted this quick win. We just wanted to see people signed up to these to these, ver these vertical communities, if you will. And, and then I put the map out there and I said, well, where's our product? You know, and they're just like, well, that's over here. You know, and I said, well, where's our partners? Well, they're actually, they're kind of further evolved than we are. All right, well, if our SCs are down here, then, you know, what do we need to do? And and, it, and again, it wasn't a, a thing to punish anybody or to point out the stupidity or anything like that. It was just to open up the conversation and make everybody a little bit more situationally aware that simply signing up SCs, that quick win to this community isn't really what we need. We have to develop mm. knowledge excellence. And how do we do that? And suddenly, be, you know, it's a much bigger, that's a huge, you know, when you're talking about that many thousands of people, that's a big conversation. So I personally just used it uh, just as an example, just anecdotally, as a very simple map to kind of open up that conversation and, and challenge people and say, really, that's what we want. We just want and then I and then I would use the, you know, kind of the arrows of evolution, say, well, don't we need to move the SEs along this, this evolutionary path? And all right, so how do we do that? So anyways, I won't, I won't belabor any more than that. Then other than it was a really great way to kind of stop the conversation of this quick wins and let's just get this and make everybody kind of question whether that's actually the outcome that we truly wanted. Yeah, Hopefully I, that helps. That, that's so great, Rod, because I mean, it, you, you what it sounds like you did was you, you made the magnitude of the real problem, like it, visible to everyone else in that conversation mm -hmm. and so yeah, they can... the map did i didn't you know the map did <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah they're like everybody looks at it and they're like wait a minute oh <laughs> uh-oh it's shocking it's shocking to see the that kind of democratization of the moment all of a sudden like oh wait a second they're you know the, the authority the the going for the quick win it kind of makes people go oh maybe that's not what we want <laughs> yeah and it, it, to Andrew's question, I guess, like w what I would think about is whether or not the people in the picture are so diverged from reality that a, a revelatory moment like that would hurt or help. Mm -hmm. You have to be really careful because in, in Rod's case, they responded well and they played along and they 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 wanted to join in and understand and and then they had that revelation it's like oh this is what's happening okay but if you're in an environment where that's not going to happen where if you share something it's not safe to share the reaction is going to be bad 
or it's going to be just so disturbing that they they will react in in erratic ways and only you know that situation best you have to take a more subtle approach and i think sometimes like hiding the map is a useful way to go about this too if if you have to be more subtle then can't like what do you not want to be you, you don't want to be the pain person the 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 person who's always bringing up all the problems and is you know always causing things to be like slowed down and all this. instead you you want to be the wise person you you want to be the 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 person who shares something so important that people are ready to hear that they start thinking for themselves about the situation and I, I think one way to do that is to ask a really good question at a really opportune moment and sometimes it's hard to get practice doing that but if you've mapped a situation you might be more situationally aware than they are and sometimes the snap to get them to where you are is going to be so such a big leap that they're not going to engage it's going to be frightening it's going to be like hard so in that in that case is like hide the map and expose maybe one or two really good questions it's like hey i know what we're here to do we're talking about these quick wins i just want to check in about this specific facet like i know we need to talk about quick wins great but what about this this hairy problem that might be underneath this is there anything there and look you might you might strike out they might say no there's nothing there they might dismiss it you're gonna have to do this a thousand times in that situation to to intervene in a more subtle way and gradually like you might start to see progress there but it takes a long time to see progress in in those kinds of environments uh, david i don't know if you have any anecdotes about that or if i'm off base mm -hmm. here what do you think nothing specific um trying to think it takes uh, real patience much, yeah pretty much I, th I think you're covering it really well um and that's why we can... we talked about like name your game and stuff like what what's yeah. your intent i interrupted you david i'm sorry no i was just gonna say you, you i think you covered it really well uh, it's just a tough situation where like we can point you at some things, but ultimately you are going to have to feel out the situation for what's safe for you versus not safe and like the best way to approach it. Um, but as I typically will recommend, and I think so does Ben in, in these situations is at the very least and sometimes at the very best, knowing yourself what's going on and feeling comfortable and understanding that is really useful. Mm -hmm. If nothing else to know that like you're not at fault and that you know you're <laughs> you know what's you know what you're talking about and you're okay yeah. it sounds like andrew is off yeah. mute now yeah he wanted to respond i'm gonna look for can a book you, real quick can you hear me now i can yeah yeah sorry about that that was a bit awkward wasn't it um thanks very much for that i don't really have a lot to add but i thought <laughs> at least i can get my voice uh, yeah in there. But, yeah awesome. it's an interesting interesting environment there's, there's so many things uh, all sort of swilling around. Uh, the priorities are are not necessarily what they seem. But getting people to focus long enough on on any one kind of um, narrowish way of thinking about something, everyone's sort of scattering around and uh, bouncing from one thing thing to another. We're trying to develop a policy in a large government organisation at the moment mm. that's going to set the direction of um, the way they approach. Um, enterprise business process management over the next yeah. few years. And it's really significant. Um, it's going to place a, a significant sort of burden on on the organization. So it's got to be valuable for them. But getting people mm -hmm. to focus long enough on just developing that policy, doing enough background work, consultation, um, analysis, and so on. Uh, so they'll, they'll get a consultant. Uh, I'm a consultant, by the way. So whenever I disc yeah. consultants, I'm sort of pointing at myself as well, but they um, uh, uh, put you know, some consultant in a box and say, write this policy and then come out when you're finished. And I, I keep trying to sort of point them, them in the direction of of um, a bit more robust 
um, exploration and analysis and so on. But yeah, but they don't have the sort of time for that. So if we can, even if we can structure our thinking a bit more clearly, then we can make some make it a bit more solid. I guess that's the sort of general feeling anyway. Yeah, as soon I mean, as I it, heard, it makes sense. That makes sense to me. Why, if you have huge decisions with major consequences, why people might be kind of scattered and trying to do a whole bunch of everything else, um, being maybe a, maybe a little bit afraid, whether they're aware of it or not, of making the wrong decisions and choosing the wrong directions potentially, and having the consequence of that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks very much. Something. Yeah, some thanks for the question. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah, it's real. It's it's a real kind of situation. And, and something it reminded me of is like the the long cycles with with too few feedback loops, right? Where you you have to go off and build a thing and then bring it back, and you're like, ta da! Now what? Yeah. Um, there there it reminded me of there's a, a gentleman by the name of Venkatesh Rao. And some of you probably have heard of him. Um, he he wrote a, a blog series that he turned into some books. And the, in the second volume, the Superstructures book, there's an essay in there called uh, Don't Build a Hill to Die On. And it's this idea, like, when consultants are faced with, like, a situation, that, and they, they have these perfect tools. Like, I have your solution for you. Here's the six months of research that I've done, and ta-da, here I'm revealing it to you. Um, what you often find is that uh, they don't see the value the way they need to because they weren't involved earlier. They don't. They don't. They aren't interested in your way of seeing things. Yeah. And so, Venkatesh offers some some like an alternative way to engaging there. And I don't know how neatly it would map with the situation that you're in. But one of the things he says, um, and I'll, I'll put a link to this. Uh, yeah, Andre, there's there's a link to it just above. Um, it's the second volume on that page. Uh, superstructures. He he, Venkatesh basically says, become someone who's fun to hang around, <laughs> for for yeah. lack of a better way to put it, and and expose people to these re really interesting ideas. Like, and he calls it being a portal or like playing with portals. It's like there's a bunch of cool stuff over there, and every time you hang out with me, you get to see a little bit more of the cool stuff. Yeah. Like I, it's a, it's a, it's a tough proposition, but it's, it's an interesting thought direction to go in. And so I just wanted to mention it. Yeah. Yeah. It takes patience and yeah, play the long game. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thanks. Yeah. So we need to wrap up here soon, but there's one more question on the list. And I, I suspect that, uh, this is a, this will be a fun one to end on. I think so. <laughs> If everything evolves based on the market, is it in the interest of professionals like lawyers to evolve? <laughs> I wonder what experiences you've had with lawyers. <laughs> yeah, is the person who wrote that question still with us? By any I'd chance? love to hear that. And uh, in the absence of that, like, it's it's interesting because we we often get stuck on like technology change mm -hmm. but one of the fun things with technology change is that practice change comes right along with it it's one of the principles that that wardley shares um he calls it co-evolution of practice and it's like so for every every technology let's say every every kind of work that gets done like lawyering or software development or whatever there are a set of practices that come along with it but as the technologies and the ways of working like as, as the work itself changes so do the practices and some folks adapt to those more readily than others and at, at the beginning it's risky to adapt right that's that's what evolution is telling us is that like the game early in evolution is risk if you try to ad adopt something that's in Genesis, that's novel, that's barely a concept, mm -hmm. you are playing a risky game. So if you're trying to write a book using chat GPT right now, that's that a might choice. be a little bit risky. <laughs> 
So, and that's, that's because it's chaotic. That's because it's changing all the time. It hasn't stabilized, but over time it does stabilize. And so you might, you might look at lawyering and you might say, well, lawyering is probably over here, or maybe it's, it's just about here. It's, it's pretty far along, but what's changing underneath it, the technology, right? Um, so the people who tried to use LLMs to cite case precedent, which is a real thing that happened, a real lawyer mm -hmm. used chat GBT to, to cite cases, to build, uh, you know, basically Defense precedent. Or, yeah. And it was the case, it made up the cases, it fabricated them. They didn't exist. And then there was this long drawn out process where they went in front of a judge and had to explain to themselves how they found those cases. Ooh, it's not a good day to be that lawyer. Um, so the technology changes, but there are probably ways that as a lawyer, you could use a technology like that to benefit you. So for example, writing the sales copy on your website, or to at least get started with that without not, so you don't have a blank page to start with and you need to do sort of like copywriting. There, there are, there are ways that these practices change and, and lawyering is changing too. And David, you've had some recent experiences with like just learning about lawyering and how mm -hmm. some are doing like subscription services as opposed to an hourly rate, which is really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So a friend of mine recommended their lawyers to me um, and as I'm moving to a different, um, different mm -hmm. location. So I need some more local stuff done. And the lawyer has a subscription service, like Ben said. Like they'll do normal lawyer things for you normally, but with just the way subscriptions and people buy and and you know customer trends now, their approach was, hey, what if people weren't afraid to go to a lawyer and you had to drop a thousand to three thousand dollars every time you had a question? So people would be afraid to ask a question. What if you just paid a little bit of money and you could ask anything you wanted, anytime you wanted, and then any of the kind of like formal paperwork kind of stuff that needed to be done, you know, it still costs what it costs, but you get a little bit of a discount because you're a subscriber to this thing. Um, that way it takes a lot out of the fear of clients not asking questions they should be, which then gets you out of situations of like, oh, I'm in a bad place because I didn't ask the thing I should have asked because I was worried that I'd be charged a couple hundred bucks for asking a question that wasn't useful because I didn't know what to ask. Yeah. And then it would take me another thousand dollars to get to the question I should have asked and so on. So the practices, the general practices of, of this law firm have changed. So like this wouldn't have existed 10, 20, 50 years ago. Now, funny enough, it may have existed 50 years ago in a local, like in a town where maybe there was, you know, like a, a small lawyer in a small town. Like I, if I remember correctly, like my great grandfather uh, worked with like local farmers and stuff. And it was kind of like trading chickens and eggs for legal advice mm -hmm. um, where it was a little bit like everyone knew each other and things were a little bit different than they are today. But I think the bigger picture is just seeing like, what's the trend over time and what is the thing that's happening now is a different practice than at a different time. And how does that change? Yeah. And we, we can kind of see it here too. This is from, Wardley, he describes how different kind of contract structures work in different stages of evolution. And like on the left, when things are hugely uncertain, which frankly is is how a lot of like lawyering gets experienced, right? You have a client who has no idea how, like they don't know what the law is. They don't know what the civil precedence is, if it's a civil case. They, they're, they're completely like dealing with a real world situation with a lot of moving parts and the lawyer has to get up to speed and they have no idea what it's going to take in order to serve the client well. And so they, they, what do they do? They, they charge you a retainer and then they just bill you by the hour against that retainer. Cause they don't even think you'll pay. Right. So then you move on to like, um, certain kinds of lawyering, 
right, w that are outcome based, where what they do is they just take a cut of the settlement. So uh, wrongful termination, or maybe like, I think the more common one is like workplace injury. Uh, in the US, th there's not a lot of social safety net, right? So um, if and there's an egregious sort of like proliferation of employers using unsafe business, pra business practices that put people at risk. And so there are lawyers out there who know that if X, Y, and Z is true, I can win. And so the way they do is they promise the outcome or they don't take you on as a client. And so they can, they can do an outcome-based arrangement. And then some are some, some kinds of lawyering are like, Hey, if you want an LLC, give me a thousand bucks and I'll do it for you. And that's a flat rate. They just know the work that it takes to do that kind of lawyering. And then what David's talking about is, is getting closer and closer to commodity. It's like a subscription service where you, you get a bundle of things that are, you know, you get so many hours of, you get free consultation on this, you get so many hours of that. And so do, the way you look at lawyering changes when you pay attention to evolution. And that's at a high level. You can zoom in into more specific situations and examine those more directly. So I don't know. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. I can I can think of lawyers at every stage of this of this overall picture. I was like, huh, interesting. That was actually quite impressive. <laughs> I, uh, I so everybody makes jokes about lawyers. I think I think uh, lawyers are are deeply misunderstood. <laughs> but they're very um, needed. They're very much popular opinion. Uh, <laughs> anyways, so I guess we should probably wrap up there. I like thanks everyone for joining us. This has been so much fun, and and thanks for playing along with us. Um, again, I'll just uh, mention that if you want to get notified about future events, um, go to lwm.events/learningplan, and you can put your email there. You'll get um, in a follow-up email just a bunch of resources about how to learn worthy mapping, things you might not know about yet, um, unless you're Rod Leverton, in which case you definitely know about them. But <laughs> that's how it goes. And uh, if you ever, ever, ever need anything, please let us know. David and I are so happy to hear from you. I'll throw my email in chat as well. It's ben at hiredthought.com. Um, we, we love yeah. hearing from you. And if, yeah. if you need if you need help doing any of this stuff specifically for work or or any of that stuff, we do consult. So we're always happy to talk more seriously. Yeah. We're, we're happy to talk casually. But if you're like, I really need some serious help, just reach out. Yeah. Uh, you can also find us at learnworthymapping.com. Just open up the contact form there. Um, I run that site. And so you can find us that way if you don't remember emails. We love working on this stuff with you. With that... Thank you all so, so much. I hope you have a great rest of the week. Be well, happy mapping. May you make many maps and be inspired. Bye, everyone.